Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, please help me give a huge start up grind. Ottawa, welcome to Ethan from Frank and Oak. So uh, Ethan's here to share uh, his story of uh, Frank and Oak with us tonight. Uh, they basically launched in February 2012, have seen some pretty incredible growth, um, have pretty much flipped e-commerce on its head, now doing the same thing to physical retail with a store just up the road here in Ottawa. We're going to talk about that tonight as well. So. Um, Basically, uh, Ethan also oversees um, the whole customer development and, and customer shopping experience at Frank and & Oak. Um, and they raised uh, a really huge round back in September. Um, so yeah, let's give another huge round and thank you to Ethan. Uh, thank you. So, so we always like to start Startup Grind off by getting to know a little bit more about you. So can you tell us uh, like where you're from, uh, what did you study, and, and uh, what was your family life like? Growing up. Sure, sure, yeah. I'm actually kind of like a quiet guy, so I don't, I don't talk about myself uh, a lot, but I'll, I'll tell you guys. I, uh, I was born in China, actually, and I uh, came to uh, Montreal when I was six and a half. Um, and I grew up in Quebec, actually, and my dad was um, doing his postdoc in physics. You know, we're Asian, Asian family. Uh, and, uh, and then, like, that's how I came about to be in Canada. Uh, and then, uh, I guess, like, I come from an entrepreneurial family. My dad, after his uh, dad started like a, a technology company in the 3D imaging space, uh, so I kind of really got into like uh, just consumer tech uh, when I was a teenager. He was kind of working with like Pixar, a lot of the kind of graphics uh, imaging guys, like in the kind of late 90s. I don't know if you guys remember when uh, like um, like Jurassic Park came out, and then like all of a sudden like in EA Sports game, it was like the real face of the players. That's kind of like when I got really interested in that. And then uh, what's interesting is that at the same time, I, I got interested in like theater and acting. So I started doing a lot more like kind of performance art. Uh, and that's how I ended up in Vancouver. Um, I don't know how in details you guys need to know. But <laughs> when I was out there, I, I did that. I went to theater school, finished. And I was working uh, kind of in the art space in Vancouver. And really got interested, like kind of went back to technology and this whole like concept of like art and technology was something that I've always been really passionate about so I ended up doing uh, computer engineering as well while I was working the arts so I guess what's interesting is that uh, what we do at Frank and Oak definitely combines uh, this idea of storytelling uh, with elements I guess of technology so I think that's how it came about uh, they always say you have to connect the dots backwards so I guess like a lot of the things I've learned so far have helped me to create a business with you. It's awesome. And so, uh, like, before we get into kind of uh, what you're doing with, with Frank and Oak right now, you used to work uh, at Deloitte. Uh, so what were some of the biggest lessons from that kind of corporate environment and, and, you know, did it push you to want to start your own thing as well? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, like, uh, when, I, when I did finish school, I felt Vancouver was, like, a great city to live in, but back then there wasn't a lot happening. Uh, now it's actually changed tremendously, so uh, now it's, I think it's a much better place to be in. So I, I came back to Montreal. I was kind of looking for something to do. I wasn't sure like what, when to start with. And uh, my partner, Isham, in our business, he was working at Deloitte at the time. He's like, oh, why don't you come work here for a bit? Uh, you know, get, get a little bit more like experience and then start your thing. So that's what I did. Um, I mean, people always ask me, always consulting like a good school for like, you know, being an entrepreneur. I think that uh, I would say the one thing about being an entrepreneur that you realize really quickly is that like I've always been like, if the product is the best, you're going to succeed. Well, in most cases, that, that's not always true, right? Like, it, there's so many things that you have to do well. So I definitely think that getting just kind of general business experience is still a good thing. And I think consulting is one of the places where you can get that experience. Uh, I think the other thing that you, you end up getting in consulting is exposure to various industries, right? So, like, one thing I was really lucky is that because I was based in Montreal, most of our clients were retailers. So I actually got a lot to learn more about kind of the way that the industry was shifting at a higher level, which uh, also help. Cool, so I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things I wanted to ask you was how do you evaluate ideas and what kind of, why did you settle on the fashion industry to start a, a kind of a startup or the e-commerce fashion area yeah. to start a startup in? Yeah, it, it's really interesting because like we, I think like a lot of like um, startup founders, it wasn't like we had the idea, like there was no idea. It was just like, we want to start something in the consumer space and then like, um, it wasn't that clear that it was going to be menswear. It wasn't that clear it was going to be like e-commerce. Uh, when we first started, we didn't have any experience uh, in fashion, nor did we have any experience in e-commerce. So it's, it was more like the desire to do something, you know. And I think that you figure it out over time. Um, and I definitely 
would have done a lot of things differently if I would have known better. <laughs> um, but I think for us was we wanted to do something that a lot of, we could touch a lot of people. So that was one of the element. And the second aspect was that when we first started, we, were, we actually wanted to create more of a platform. And I guess that kind of evolved more into a brand. And uh, the thinking around that was very important for Frank and Oak, um, just because it changes a lot of decisions you take. And in our case, being a brand was the right decision. Um, because for us, we realized that having that full stack of owning the product, owning the experience, and owning the, the, the full shipping aspect was something that like, was very highly differentiated and competitive. So that was part of the, the thinking. Uh, but how it really got started was, literally we were looking at making a product, but we didn't know what to make and where to make it. And we were just lucky that we, like there was this one guy that we met who was like, oh, I know how to make shirts. So I was like, oh, give me some shirts. And that's how we got started. Cool, so take us through that story a little bit more. Like where did the brand come from? Where did the name come from? How did you guys first piece, piece that part of the business together? Yeah. You know, obviously you friend with the shirt, but how did you go from there? Well, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but we started another business before we started Frank and Oak. Uh, which is kind of like, that's the story that people were interested in hearing two years ago, but I can tell you guys again. Um, so the shirt, because we could only make shirts, we're like, well, what's so differentiated about shirts? So we said, well, let's make custom shirts, right? So like, obviously there's a lot of custom business, like probably you guys are aware, like some of my good friends in the Chino and Vancouver are in that business. So we start with shirts, we're like, okay, well, how can we make this whole idea of like mass customization, which is interesting because we're here, uh, which there's a lot of mass customization in this space, how can we bring this idea of mass customization to clothing, right? So that was kind of like the initial idea and, and that company was called Motosuite and we did that for about like 10 months. Um, and we built a small team, about five or six. We grew like our business from doing like nothing the first month, doing about like 70,000, like, you know, by like month 10 or something. So it actually got to a certain decent size, I would say, um, but we just realized that it, for our customer, it wasn't so much like, having the choice of making you know, changes on their shirts that they cared about. It was more about making shopping easier, saving them time, making it simpler, making it more engaging. So we realized that what our business focused on, like the, the pain point that we tried to solve, it was, it was a pain point for a few people, but not for everyone. So then we kind of switched basically our focus. And we just realized that, well, if you're gonna switch your focus, sometimes it makes more sense to rebrand as well. So that's how we launched our brand. But I think a story that's interesting is that uh, we had raised a little bit of money at that time. And then um, we had basically like about like three months left of cash. Like, I mean, like when you're in like a seed startup, it feels like you always have three months left of cash. But in our case, that's what we had left. And it was like, well, do we go, do we take that three months to go and raise a little bit more capital? Do we take that, you know, what do we do with that three months, right? And I think it's a question where uh, you can, or do we stretch it? Like, what do we do? So we decided actually to take half of our resources, which are like basically two and a half people, and put them on this Frank and Oak project. Uh, and we built Frank and Oak in parallel uh, to the other side that we we're running. So that's kind of like how the pivot happened. Um, so when we launched Frank and Oak, we were still running the other side as well. And yeah, I guess it was like a, like a ballsy and risky move, but at the time it didn't seem like that. You know, I think that when you, when you look back, you're like, well, like, if it didn't work out, basically would have been left with nothing, but then what's the big deal, right? Like you're trying to make something happen. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. It's part of the, you know, the entrepreneurial lifestyle. So we took that move, we took that risk, and it just happened that some of the insight that we had around customers were, were really, worked really well, and it worked fast enough that we could actually flip that business into Frank and Oak. So where did the name come from? Frank and Oak? Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's kind of like two stories to that. Um, the real story is the startup story, which is like, because we only had two months to build a site, the product and everything, we literally just had a week to decide. So it was just kind of like, we put names on it. Like every startup, we put names on a sheet of paper and it was just like, oh, like, um, what were we gonna do? But the one thing that we did learn is that, especially in fashion, like you want your name to mean nothing. You know, like if, if let's say your brand's, like, your brand's name is like performance wear, well, if you don't do performance wear anymore, you're kind of stuck, right? So we realized that we didn't want it to mean anything and that we wanted it to be friendly. Like we didn't want it to be pretentious, we wanted it to be like friendly and not, not overly cool actually, which was our thing. Um, so that's how we came up with the name. So what we did is that we knew we wanted like an end name. 
So we just listed like 20 names on a sheet of paper and these listed 20 other names on another sheet of paper and we were just like this plus that, that plus that and eventually, it was actually in the beginning it was Franklin and Oak, uh, but then we felt like it was too kind of men's tailoring so then we dropped like the, the end of Franklin and then it became Franklin Oak. Cool. And so, how did you guys get the? You know, you launched the, you, you relaunched the after the pivot. You launched an e-commerce site. How'd you guys go about getting your first couple customers and getting the brand out there? What was some of the first critical steps? Yeah, so I, I would say like, um, I think this is a really important part of any kind of consumer brand or a like consumer internet company. It's kind of how do you get some form of like viral growth? Like how do you get some form of like repeatable? You know, people sharing, and like, how how do you make sure that every person that comes to you will bring two of their friends? I think that uh, we definitely nailed that in the first few months, and that was a lot of the learnings that we had with the previous business. So, like, when we on the day that we did we launched Ranking Up, we had already got like I think eight thousand email on our mailing list. Okay. So it wasn't like we had like five customers and we had to go build. We we had built the the customer base before the day that we even launched. Right. So, like, we had a landing page. We were signing up people before we even launched. We did a bunch of contests, we did some really good PR. Uh, we tapped into like very specific communities where we said like, hey guys, I think you guys should be interested by this. I can give you early access to all of your membership if you're gonna post, right? So one of the thing about Frank, I don't know if you guys remember, some of you guys, maybe you follow us from the beginning, is that you could not join, right? That was the thing was, that was very effective, was that literally you could not join, and whenever you join, everything was sold out. So it, it kind of really created this like, like gaming scarcity aspect that really especially worked with like tech oriented guys because they were like, oh, what is this thing? Uh, and it made people talk and it was kind of like, if you do join and if there is a product to be bought, like you're very lucky. Did you you guys, <laughs> was, was there some kind of internal discussion about that or like did you guys feel kind of worried about doing that and, and basically showing sold out or was that part of the plan? I mean, I think that like you, here, here's the way it is. Like we, we weren't worried about it because we had 8,000 people on our mailing list. So we figured there's enough people to buy for the first little while. And then if it kind of decreases, you can open up a little bit more. So obviously we control how many people we let in, but the way that it worked was that if you invited, I think it was three people, you could come in right away. But like they had to also sign up. So basically it created a situation where like every person that came in had to bring like more people to sign up. So that, that was very effective. And then the other thing was that we created all these like passwords that you could basically like if you had the password you could sign up today without inviting anyone and then we leaked the password on a bunch of like forums and social medias and that was actually really cool because like they would get posted like on a forum and then people like ah it doesn't work this password anymore you know does someone else have another password and then we also gave passwords to, like a bunch of companies that are friends of ours and then like they could share it with their employees so it just i, I think that the, the point is that People ask me, oh, should I do these tactics? And I, I, I don't know, because like, at that time in, in the history of like, the internet, it was very effective. There's a few companies like ours that did it, and it was very effective. I don't know that today's customer would want to do that. You know what I mean? So, but I think that you can still figure out what is that, that thing that you can do with today's customer to kind of get the wheels turning. Sure. Right? So like one, one example that I have is that, um, I don't know if you guys saw this, like, uh, like about two months ago, we launched this crowdfunding campaign uh, to kind of crowdfund our stores in the U.S., yeah. right? So um, people were, and we basically made like, we had 12 cities up and it was like Boston against New York and like New York against like, even New York against Brooklyn, they were not the same city. Uh, and people were like, well, why do you do that? Like, it, it feels like you're asking a lot of your customers. But I don't think you're asking a lot of your customers if your customer is engaged. Like, if they actually want to be participate, you're actually giving them a chance to participate, right? So. Uh, what was really interesting about that was that we got a lot of traffic, yes, from people that wanted to vote for their city, but also from people that were just like, this is a cool concept. You know, so, like, you can, even at scale, you can do that and find ways to, like, kind of market, like, uniquely with your customer and create, like, some kind of uh, viral loop around that. Um, but what it does, when you, when you look at, you know, crowdfunding, let's say, a store, is that you're basically saying, well, we'll come if you guys want us to come. You know, and I think there's something very powerful about that. Mm -hmm. And typically, like a brand would, let's say, open Soho or New York first. But no, if you're in Austin, Texas, and you give Frank and Oak more love than the guys in New York, we will open Austin first. And I think this is the kind of philosophy that really gets people engaged in the process. And if you voted for your city to have a store, the day that we open our store, I'm pretty sure you're going to be there also. You know, so it's... It's, it's this kind of thinking and uh, 
there's no secret to growth. And I think a lot of it has to do with these kind of like unique strategies. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get back more to the, like the retail stores in just a bit. But um, so after you guys started getting some traction, you ended up raising a total of, of 20 million bucks so far. Yeah. How did you approach VCs uh, to, to raise that money? What was your process like? Um, who'd you talk to? How'd you, how'd you talk to them? What did you show them? Yeah. How did you spin, I guess, the, the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say like, um, I mean, I think like a lot of, like a lot of startup always ask me kind of like, oh, how do you go about raising? How do you see? How do you series A? And like, I, I think that like, Raising is important because like if you don't have the capital, you probably can't grow or you can't grow as, as fast as you want to grow. But it's it's not what the business should be about. So like I feel like like the amount doesn't really matter. I think it's better if you raise less. You know, like that's my personal opinion. I think that we're in, we're in a consumer business that unfortunately requires a certain level of capital. Um, but other than that, I would say how do you go about it? I think that what's interesting within like Frank and Oak's been around for almost four years. I guess like three and a half years. It's still very short. And like we've seen cycles in the market, like we've seen times where like you know it was so easy where people like were basically like coming to us, you know, with offers, and we've seen time where it was super quiet where we had to do like a full roadshow and do presentations. So I think that in the life cycle of a business, you're gonna see both like kind of like times where like money is easy to get and when time money is hard to get, um, and that's the reason why like how much you get, how fast you get it, is not necessarily a reflection of the quality of your business or what you're trying to do. Uh, that's the first thing. The second part, I definitely think that uh, from an investor's perspective, I think it's all about data. You know, like there's, there's market hype, but you can always raise if you have the data to support what you say. So definitely, like I always tell people like, yes, you need to collect data, but have like hypotheses that you're trying to prove. You know, even if it's six months, what are you trying to prove here? And what are the data points that you can build to prove that? And if you can prove that, if let's say the investor says, oh, I can't really fund this right now, then six months you can continue to come back and say, look, I followed my path, I've continued to prove it, and I found that like, a lot of it happens from relationships. Uh, but I, I mean, I, one thing that I, I would say is that, and it's interesting, is that once you get investments from Canadian investors, American investors, like Silicon Valley investors, you do, you do find that there's also differences in the culture. Like there's differences in the culture and expectation of the investors and differences in culture and you know, the companies that they're usually working with versus like, let's say a company here. And I, I think it's important to understand that because otherwise uh, the expectations may not be the same. Any tips on how to navigate that, that different culture for people who are looking to Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe I mean, in, in Montreal, <laughs> we always have that discussion. I'm sure in Ottawa, you guys also have the discussion, which is like, oh, you know, we're in Canada. We're in like a smaller space, you know, and like there's just not as much money here. And it's true. So you kind of have to be aware of it and accept it and see what you can do, right? So. And I think that like in the last few years, we've seen a lot of Canadian companies being extremely successful, both from a business standpoint and from a cash raising standpoint. So you can definitely make it happen. Uh, I would say that, I think, I think one thing is that you have to assume that it's gonna take a little bit more time in Canada. Like it takes longer to prove out business models. It takes longer um, to have enough data to get those large rounds. I think that you have to be a little bit more patient uh, in Canada versus the US. Uh, but in terms of difference of culture, I think that yeah, I, I definitely think that like some investors here, you know, they made their expectation maybe that you know you grow, I don't know, like, let's say like forty percent year over year, and that's that's good. And someone you know somewhere else may say, well, I want you to grow like hundred percent year over year. Well, that's two very different businesses. It's two very different levels of risks. Uh, and I think you just need to you need to first understand what you want to do as an investor and uh, as as an entrepreneur, and then get investors that will align with that. Absolutely cool. Um, so. Mobile has played a pretty huge role for Frank and Oak. Um, how has it also changed, I guess, the retail and e-commerce space? How have you guys used mobile to reach more people or do better, cooler things? Well, I think mobile is really interesting because I think that like, um, well, first of all, obviously, I think we're all aware that mobile is taking over our lives, right? So regardless of commerce, we're way more on our mobile than we're on our desktop. Pretty much desktop is only for work now, right? So, uh, you know, the majority of our emails are being opened on mobile, like uh, a good part of our sales come from mobile. And, and the truth is, like, in, in North America, we're actually, like, much slower, right? So, like, let's say that, as an example, like, I was looking at some data today, like, the adoption of e-commerce is growing by, like, I think, like, 12% a year, but the adoption of mobile commerce right now is, like, like you know, 20-something percent. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, from a commerce perspective, or actually, you know what, from, from any kind of application, lifestyle application perspective, it's just a more natural kind of element. It just feels more natural to engage on mobile it's easier, so I definitely think it's a platform that's gonna grow. Like, if you look at a country like Korea or like China, like 80% of all like e-commerce transactions are done on mobile for a lot of brands out there. 80% is a lot, right? It means that like most people are buying on mobile, 
And I think that we have to assume that although we're a little bit slow here, that we will get to that point as well. So um, what I always tell a lot of like, like traditional retailers that are still kind of thinking about e-commerce or trying to figure out e-commerce, I'm like, well, if you're trying to get a team to do e-commerce and you're not even thinking about mobile commerce, like you're already like five to 10 years late yeah. um, and you're not where your customer is. But I think what's, what's really good about mobile and what get, gets me really passionate about it is the fact that it's just a perfect application for like commerce. It's a perfect application for hyper-local businesses. It connects your identity with your favorite store, with your brand, with your credit card, and with local stores as well. So that's the reason why it's so powerful. It's not, it's not a web page, it's, it's much more than that, like to a personal assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, we've had like, we had, we've dedicated a team to mobile like a long time ago, two years ago. So we have an Android app, iPad app, iPhone app, um, all native. So like, you know, we push content, we have exclusive products, we have like a marketing team dedicated to mobile. Our mobile application is also a pillar between our, our online and store experience. And we do see that there's a lot of traction on that. That's awesome. Yeah, no, the Android application, I've, I've personally played with a whole bunch and it's pretty yeah. cool. So. Um, another thing you guys did pretty, uh, pretty early on was the, the introduction of the Hunt Club, which was kind of like the monthly subscription box thing. Yeah. I think it came along kind of in early in that, in that phase. So why did you guys decide to do that? And, and you know, what are the benefits of still running that today, I guess? Yeah, so, um, well, it's interesting because a lot of people ask me about it because we don't run it anymore. Okay. Um, but we phased it out in a very subtle way because we didn't turn it off. We transformed it into another membership. So the reason why we started with like a monthly subscription model was the fact that if, you, if we go back to what I was talking about before, which is we wanted to make shopping really easy for guys, right? So the idea, the reason why Frank and Oak does monthly collection was that, you know, when you get that like... GQ or whatever like lifestyle magazine you're into every month and you like you just get at home and you open it and you're like wow this is like the lifestyle I want well, well what if like basically like a whole box like instead of getting that just that magazine and you have to go and find that piece or like oh this is like a thousand dollars I have to find like the hundred and fifty dollar version of that jacket you could just get the magazine and the pieces all together delivered to your door every month that was the initial value proposition for Frank and Oak and it was very effective uh, we got a lot of traction from that um, so it, it's, it's an important component. It's an important component of making your life easier. Um, why we evolved this, so now we don't run on a monthly model anymore, we run on an annual model, so you can get the same service, but we don't charge on a monthly basis, was just that as you get to a certain size, you just want to give more options to your customers. Like you realize that not every single customer wants to have a monthly rhythm. Some people like to spend like $400 every three months. You know, some people like to spend $50 every month. And you have to give that flexibility to your customer uh, in order to get a larger pool of customers. So we've kind of increased the flexibility, but the philosophy of like making shopping easier for you, of kind of removing that aspect from your life, uh, is still very effective. I mean, I would say one of the thing that's interesting about Hunt Club is that, like, when we started this business, there's always a saying like, guys don't like to shop, right? Like, guys, like, women are are, are the buyers in the market. Like, that's the reason why there's not a, there's less men's business, and I think that. What we realized, especially for a younger customer, like we're, we're really targeting like a 25, 35 year old, was that that guy is social, right? That guy wants to go out, he definitely wants to look good, he's dating, you know, he's active, so it's not so much that he doesn't want to buy products, it's more that like he doesn't spend his weekend at the mall. So how do we create an experience where we feed the product to him so he can just look good without actually having to go to the mall? That was a lot of the kind of initial uh, idea behind Frank and Oak. Cool. So you've talked a lot so far about making you know the shopping experience easier and sort of the shopping experience of the future a little bit. Um, so you guys went from from online e-commerce to pop up to now physical retail yeah. stores, Montreal, Ottawa. You're talking about a crowdfunding campaign to open some up in the states. W what are you guys doing with the with the actual physical retail? Why go retail when so many other stores are shutting down? Shutting down too. Well, I mean, I think that like. Um like the fact that we're going to retail has nothing to do with a sh store shutting down. I, I think that this year, it's, it, it's really funny because I really feel like this year was a year of like omni-channel. That's what everyone talks about. How like, especially in Canada, because a lot of closure is happening. And like the truth is, we're not counter, you know, trend in the sense that we're not like saying, oh, because people are shutting down, we got to go in. Uh, it, like, I actually didn't know that they were all shutting down. But uh, I think that a lot of people say it's the internet. Right, that's making stores shut down. I think it's not the internet from an e-commerce perspective. If you think about it, like a lot of the stores, especially in Canada, benefited from like not having international competition. Right? Then all of a sudden, you have like international players that come into local markets, 
that better products are cheaper and are bringing new styles much faster. So literally, your product is not competitive. It doesn't matter if it's online or offline, your product is not competitive. After that, like, what, I think what's happened to a lot of stores, uh, especially because a lot of stores don't necessarily have a lot of data, was that it's like, oh, my traffic at my store decreased by 5% this month, and another 5% next month. But over a two or three years period, all of a sudden my store is not profitable anymore. I think that's what's happened in retail. Uh, and I think the reason why is because part of those customers have moved online, and part of those customers have moved online buying from brands that are not in Canada. They're either like in Europe or like, you know, they're in the, from the US. And, and that whole idea of like geography in retail doesn't really exist as much anymore. I think that by nature, every brand should be globalized. Like there is no, there's no other option. Because if, let's say all of you guys, you spend 25%, let's say, uh, of your spendings on products that you buy on the internet that are shipped from the US, well, if a brand here does not sell to the US, you guys see what's happening, then of course, you're gonna have less sales, right? So I always say, like Frank and Oak, when we launched, we were always available globally. Uh, we don't ship everywhere, but like people could look at it, people could buy it in a lot of places, which meant that we didn't really look at the Canadian market as being like an area of focus. Now, what's interesting, of course, you're gonna say, well, okay, it seems like that makes sense, but then why open stores, right? So I think that the thing that's interesting is that, well, there's two reasons, right? One, which is for us, it, it's all about investment in buying traffic. Like when it comes to growing a retail or any kind of consumer business, it's how much traffic can you bring to your site and how much you're gonna pay for that traffic, right? So when you look at it that way, we look at how much we want to invest in mobile, how much we want to invest online, how much we want to invest in stores. So it's not as big of a deal as it seems because we actually invest only a very small portion in stores. So that's one thing. Um, the second part is it has to do with the values of your brand. Like Frank and Oak is a brand that stands for like authenticity and creating real like human-like relationships with our customers. And we just realized that like having a localized space allows us to like create deeper relationships with our customers. And that's the reason why, from a marketing stand perspective, if you add traffic plus deeper relationship, then you're, you ask yourself, well, where else can I do that? And how much is that gonna cost me? And that's where you realize that having some level of retail actually makes sense. Now, where it gets really interesting is that I think it's all about being where your customer is. It's all about creating interesting experiences where your customer is. So, what we're able to offer a customer is multiple touch points, but each touch point having its own dedicated value that's different than another touch point. And that's what makes it really interesting. Um, it also makes it that you're not dependent on the cost of acquisition of one channel versus another channel. You can actually break it down depending on the city you're in. That's really cool. So when you guys introduced those, those actual uh, physical locations, um, was there any kind of business model change required internally from a sort of more of a culture point of view, I guess? Like thinking about the retail experience in a physical layout, thinking about how you're going to present the product. I mean, yeah. Apple does a lot of it. Did you guys kind of go through sh changing some of your, your thinking and, and sort of some of the mechanics of the business model from online to retail? Um, so we haven't changed like the business model. So like in our stores, just like online, we do monthly collections and the full collection flips once a month. Okay. Um, we've also brought our content into the stores and we also brought our personal service to the store. So in, in that case, it was almost looking at, and it, it's funny because I, I've been thinking a lot about like, well, what is, what is Frank and Oak then, right? Like if it's not an e-commerce site and I realize it's, it's the combination of the product that we sell and the customer profiles that we have. That's the, that's the core of our business. And then the, the mobile and the stores are kind of like the gateway to that and how you create like a fun, engaging and, and like, uh, kind of deep relationship oriented gateway, that's what it is. Um, so when um, it comes to, within the company, I think it does change. Like we have a dedicated retail team at uh, Frank and Oak now, just because from an operations perspective, of course there's different challenges. Uh, there's more training needs, right? Like you have to train like your, your teams in the store so you represent the brand properly. There is a product aspect. So one of the things that's interesting is that some of the new kind of e-commerce stores are trying like a no inventory, you know, approach uh, to the store where basically they're like showrooms, you go in, you look. Whereas like Frank and Oak has taken more of a light inventory approach, which means that we have certain products in terms of inventory, we don't have all the products we carry online. Uh, and that makes it more complicated, but we feel as though it makes it a better experience because if our customer is gonna like, you know, drive all the way to the store, I just find that it was weird to ask them to then, oh, you have to wait three more days for us to ship you the product when you're already there. 
you know, you're already there, you want the full experience, you want to like show your friends when you leave. So we're like, well, if the purpose is brand building, then let's give them the best experience. So, but that does mean that we do have to manage our inventory across more locations. So it does create like more levels of complexity. But I think that, um, and, and I, I agree actually for a small company like Frank and Oak, like managing online in store and mobile is a challenge. Like it's a lot of different touch points you have to manage. Uh, but I just think that that's the foundation that re the retail of the future is built on. So the, the sooner we get good at all three and, and managing all three, the faster we're gonna be able to grow and the better the foundation for the future. Cool, that's, that's really awesome. And some of the other things you guys have done, uh, like in Toronto, Montreal, is, uh, is added like coffee shops and barber chairs. Yeah. Is, is that part of the, the retail experience of the future or is it just more from a technical logistical point that, that you see that happening? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting because like a lot of our stores have a lifestyle component to it and people are like, are like always that, is that the concept, you know? And I always say like, like the actual coffee shop is not the concept. Like we're not the first one to have done that and other people have done that. But the idea of a store as a, as a space for experiences is our concept. So that if you think about it, like, like a lot of stores are very transactional, right? Like you go in for a reason and then you exit the moment you're done. And then when you walk in, a lot of stores don't have the service aspect and you really just have to grab and go. Well, if you're just there to grab and go, you can have that exchange online. But if you go in and you actually can hang out, you can actually learn something, you can actually hang out with the people that are there and chat, then you have a reason to go and you have an experience there. So the, the coffee shop aspect is to really say, well, we, we have that real estate now, so let's make that half almost like the Frank and Oaks memberships clubhouse in that city and half a place to experience the product. So that, that's more like the philosophy. And I do think that a lot of retail will be going that way. Not necessarily a coffee shop, but adding more experiences that can't happen online within the physical space. Cool. Just a couple more questions. I know you guys are, are all standing, so I'll flip the, the questions over to you guys in just a few moments. But um, can, can you tell us a little bit more, um, you know, like what's, first of all, I guess, why only focus right now on menswear? And yeah. what about the other half of the population? And, and two, um, what's the future of, of Frank and Oaks? Do you guys have plans to jump into women's clothes and stuff like that? Well, I mean, I, I think that like, um, well, one of the things is that you have to, like we're already focused on retail, mobile, and online, so I think that like uh, our, our, our idea has always been to stay focused on one customer. So I think one thing that's interesting is that although we work across multiple channels, you know, we have content, we have a lot of different things that we're doing, we, we're always serving the same customer and finding ways to better serve that customer and get more of that customer, right? So, and that's the reason why we haven't rushed into women's wear. Like, will we ever get into it? Maybe. Uh, but for now, we don't have any plans yet. Um, the second aspect is that it's not because we make menswear that women are not our customer. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's really, really interesting to consider is that it's like, like let's say like the kids business is a huge business, but those babies don't buy their own clothes, right? So <laughs> what you sell and who is your target customer is not exactly the same thing. And that's the reason why when you look at Frank and Oaks advertising or content, like we don't touch on like topics like, you know, like sexiest women or like a lot of cars, like lots of muscles. And actually because, of, because we're very much aware that women are a big part of our customer. So we focus on being smart and, and that's what like attract basically both men and women and we found it's the right balance to strike. So I can't tell you what's the percentage of our sales that does come from women, but it's actually quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so we realized that it's not because you make menswear that like women are not a buyer. And definitely like when you go into one of our stores, most guys like, you rarely see like six guys kind of like trying things and showing things to each other like, hey, what do you think about that? But you definitely see a lot of couples that are kind of there on the weekend trying things. Cool, no, that's, that's a great answer, it's, it's awesome. So, um, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned so far, uh, you know, over the past four years with Frank and Oak as an entrepreneur, as a retail or e-commerce entrepreneur? Uh, anything you would do differently? Well, I mean, I think that the, the first thing that I've learned is that it takes a long time, you know? Like, I think that, uh, I always find it interesting um, because like sometimes, especially in Canada, because there's less companies, like, you know, like very quickly, like you kind of become like a symbol of success. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't, I don't recognize ourselves as being successful at all. You know, like I think that we've proven some things, but like, I feel as though like the road ahead is much like longer than, you know, the road behind. And I'm not saying that just because of our ambition, but because there is so much to be done, you know? So uh, I think that's one thing I've learned, which is like, I think a lot of people, when they start a startup, it feels like a project, right? But then eventually it, it becomes a company and things do take time. And like creating a quality product, quality brand does take time. So that's one thing that 
I always tell people like, you know, you have to learn to be patient and you can't always change your mind and you have to invest in your people because like, it's, it's not like, there is not one thing that will make or break your company most likely. And that's the reason why you have to kind of take that time. Um, other than that, I would say, I, I definitely find that like, um, I mean, everyone always says that in those talks, but definitely I think company culture is super key. And I think that like in a company like Frank and Oak, it was interesting because we have technology talent, we have fashion talent, we have content oriented talent. So we have a very diverse mix of talent, um, which is interesting. And then you have to find a way to kind of unite people under like a singular vision. And I think communicating that is something that's very important. Uh, when you first start, you don't really need to because there, there's like 10 of you guys, everyone thinks the same way. But as you grow, you kind of have to think about things a little bit differently. Um, but that said, yeah, I think that, and, and the other thing I would say is, is to just think international. Like I think that a lot of people still think like within their community and within their neighborhoods, whereas the opportunities are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays you can be based that's in Ottawa and have a huge business in like Indonesia if you want to. So there's no reason for you to think locally. Uh, although I'm not saying I think locally is a bad thing, but I'm saying when you build, build your business, think like bigger. you're open, like right? especially if it's a digital business, you're open to everything and I think that that's actually like a competitive advantage for a country like Canada. Cool. All right, well, let's flip it over to you guys. I know you've been kind of, Ryan, let's start with you at the back. How important is video to your business and what do you see in the future? Yeah, I mean like video is interesting because like we never, we, we've done like kind of video content. Uh, we've never really advertised via video like since maybe like a like few months ago. And uh, I think video is huge, like I think that we're not like the best at it yet. You know, like I think we're good at creating lifestyle content, but like, which are good from a brand perspective, but I can't say that like, you know, we're leveraging video in a super efficient, like ac customer acquisition manner. But I do think that like videos have high potential, um, especially when it comes to brands. I think that like, it's very hard to differentiate nowadays from a price and originality aspect when it comes to like, let's say like, you know, SEM or like Google marketing, because like a banner is a banner, what are you gonna say, you know? And I think that the, the next level of online advertising is actually a combination of performance marketing and creative. I think that like the last like kind of five years very, well, it's very performance data driven, and people realize that, well, it's not because you get that, you know, click through rate at this price because you use that message in that landing page that you're actually acquiring a loyal customer that really believes in what you do. And I think that video, it's part of the solution because you can you can say a lot more. You can make people feel a lot more. Uh, I think that uh, from a company perspective, it's just always a challenge because videos require a lot more time and investment to make them. Cool. Robert, how do you split your time between onboarding new customers and sort of customer retention? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that like um, at Frank and Oak, like we have a growth team and they do both because like keeping a customer definitely helps you to grow. Like, like you can't just look at new customers, but I think that um, I would say how do you split your time is that we have targets for both. So like we don't look at it in terms of like how much time we need to spend, but more like how what is the percentage of customers that we want that are new customers, and what is the percentage that we want that are repeat customers, um, and that allows us to kind of like focus our efforts, right? So like if let's say like. The, the repeat customers are really performing well, then you focus more on like first-time customers because you assume that once you get into the funnel that they will also perform well, but that's not always the case because there's different customers and you acquire new customers, so you need to think this way. I would say that from a repeat perspective, um, it's a little bit easier because like you can tell usually within the first four weeks how they're gonna perform, and then like you can have automated uh, strategies to maintain your customer base. Um, from a first-time customer perspective, I think what's interesting is that the funnel aspect, so when someone actually comes on one of your touch points, you can control that. How to drive traffic to your site in a cost-efficient way and how to scale that to like millions of people, I think it's definitely a challenge. It's a challenge for any you know, consumer brand or consumer product out there. And that's where you need a lot of like kind of innovation. Yes. So uh, can you tell us about your online merchandising? How do you take advantage uh, of uh, internet, social uh, networks, and everything to give the right product to the right client? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Uh, I think that 
there's, there's various kind of e-commerce models out there, right? So if you look at like a retailer like Amazon, uh, for them it's really a search-oriented experience, right? Which means that like they don't really optimize for anything, they just have everything. And then like based on what you search for, they show you, they, they try to show you what's most relevant to you. Uh, when we started, our idea was always, we're gonna offer more of a like editorial experience, which means that recommendation uh, is very important to us. So we actually don't show the same products to every customer. Like we, we run like different shops that actually allows us to test new products on new customers. Um, but what it does is that like, it doesn't just make it that you know, there's scarcity between the products, but for a customer, we actually find there's value because you don't have to search through thousands of products to find the products that are more valuable to you. Uh, but what I do find that's interesting is that you can still carry a lot more products online than you carry in the store. Just because like, when you go in the store and there's all this stuff and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do anymore. Whereas online, like it's unlimited space, right? So like how do you organize it is also very important. Now the one thing that I would say that's really interesting is that I think desktop merchandising is pretty standardized now. You know, like e-commerce online, you can't tweak that too much just because it's kind of like a car. People are used to shopping in the e-commerce side in a certain way. And when you try to be too innovative, actually you confuse people. Like, because people are used to having their cart at the same place and it's just like, make it easy for me, I want to get my product. Whereas on mobile, it's not fixed yet. You know, like, a lot of people are doing differently. Some people are doing much more editorial, some people are doing much more graphic. And an iPad versus like, let's say iPhone is also very different. So I think on mobile, your, your merchandising can be a lot more interesting and people don't browse through thousands of products. So the first 10 products are much more important. And I think that that's where I see a lot of innovation in terms of like merchandising recommendation. So that's huge. A couple more. There are a few more. Yes, right there. Uh, if you didn't have Frank and Hope and you couldn't do anything in the fashion industry, what industry would you try, try and disrupt? Um, yeah, it's interesting, like, uh, like what else am I, am I interested in? Yeah, what idea is going to give you rich? <laughs> okay, you rich? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, what would you do if you didn't have a regular? Well, the, the truth is I've never really picked any, like, industry, you know, because, like, I felt like there was more potential to make money. You know, I think that, like, you do have to work in an industry you're passionate about and, like, enjoy what you do. So, uh, like, as an example, is retail the most, like, high multiplier? No. Like, you know, there's other industries that are easier to sell and easier to make money on, but that's... That's not what's really important, you know, in the end. I think we're all trying to do something that's cool and fun. Um, I'm definitely interested in, like, personally in more, like, I would say, like, lifestyle marketplaces, like, like Airbnb as an example. I think that's an amazing business because it has, it has the power. And first of all, it gives you something that never existed before. Like, now you can stay in places that you never thought you could stay before. And literally, it has the power to change the world. You know, I think that, that those are the kind of business I always get passionate about. Um, but that said, like, I also have things, I also have, like, passions that's in the arts that actually cost a lot and don't make any money at all. <laughs> so, I may be doing that too, so I, I think that, but that said, like, I, I, you, I see opportunities, like, across a lot of things, like, all the time. Um, but the opportunity matters less than, like, how hard are you going to go at it to resolve it? Because, like, like, at all times, there's, like, a dozen opportunities, and, and that's one thing that's really interesting, and obviously, like, I'm sure you guys are interested in startups or you have a startup of your own is that like I don't know if you guys have done like have you guys been on the investment side but like like because we have a lot of investors I've sat with them sometimes like during a day and like these guys get like a hundred presentations a day that says like I've just discovered like the uber of like cooking or like <laughs> like, like this or that right and like and that's like one guy so you can imagine how many people are trying to solve the same thing right so and that's why I realized that like a lot of it has to do not with the idea but with execution and like with how hard you're gonna go at it and like all the micro changes you're gonna do to, to get to where you wanna be. Great segue, you mentioned Indochina at the beginning. So when you pitch the investors, how did, did they ask you to differentiate yourself from, from their model and, and, uh, and also how much help did you get from the investors that, that you took on? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think that, like, uh, like let's say, like, Indochino, I think they started in 2008 or something, so, like, almost, like, five years before us. Uh, but so did, like, let's say, Bonobos in the U.S., which is also a men's business. Like, um, I don't think it matters, to tell the truth. Like, like in the same way that, like, like let's say when, when Uber came out, there was, like, a dozen 
like taxi apps. And now there's art that doesn't taxi apps, you know? So I think that like most, at all times in, in, a, in, a, in a single opportunity, there will be multiple players. And usually there's like maybe two or three winners. Obviously some that are much bigger and some that are smaller, but there's space for a few companies within the space. Uh, I think how you differentiate is that you have to educate the investor as to what you're doing that's different. You know, and I think that um, if, they, like as an example, if they believe in let's say, let's say custom shirting, okay? If they believe in custom shirting as an industry that's growing, then they will invest in it. And like, and they may not invest in like the, the company that started first because the company that started first is not always, actually often not the winner in that market anyways. You know, so it doesn't really matter. And like, so I would say that most investors we focus on who are the entrepreneurs and what have you shown in terms of traction. Uh, but that said, I would say that this matters more in like pure tech oriented. So let's say like right now, obviously the big thing is Periscope or against Meerkat, everyone's talking about. That I agree that most, in most cases, people will go to the application that has the most users. But when it comes to like commerce, like there is like a dozen like Bill and Dar brand that are gonna be created like online in the next like 10 years. And like we could be or not be one of them, but there's a lot of opportunities. It's, it's not like one, a one winner takes all kind of market, you know? Okay. Yeah, I would like to ask a little bit about fashion aspect of your business. Yeah. With your fashion and technology company, yeah. two in one. Could you please tell, is there a particular model you guys following? Or you mentioned that you put in collections like every month. Yeah. How do you fight off peaks? And I, I can assume that it's a huge seasonality in your business. So could you please cover a little bit how do you guys deal with the fashion part of your business? I mean, it's a broad question, right? Because like, I mean, everybody's we interested in technology, but I think the real science actually is uh, in fashion. Like you mean, like let's say, like is your question how do we keep up with trends? Or how do we predict like customer behavior? Or Absolutely, like, yeah. what is our what is our design aesthetic like? Well, more customer behavior and how do we fighting off beats? How do we play collections? So. Yeah, so I mean, like one one the question like uh, a lot of people asked us from the beginning was like, well, why do you have to sell your own branded product? This is a good question because we didn't have to and we don't have to now if we wanted to. So the one thing that we did realize when we first started is that when it comes to fashion specifically, like if you don't sell your own product, the cheapest will always win. No matter how good the experience, how fast the shipping or the delivery, people will always go towards the cheapest. So it's, it's, it's a race to the bottom basically. And then at that race, we already have Amazon and like there's already a few players and it's very hard to beat, right? So by having our own product, we, we basically control the pricing. We control like at what price we sell it and at what rate we get into the market. So that's one of the first thing that we did. The second aspect is that instead of thinking in terms of seasons, like we do monthly collections and even each month collection is broken down into weekly collections, which means that there's much more granularity in the way we manage our SKU counts and like how many products we have to offer customers and how deep we want it in terms of inventory. Right, so what that does, and, and this is something that's very subtle and a lot of people don't really understand, like, you know, why you do it like that, like, is that, let's say in a traditional retailer, right? Like, in a store, they'll, they'll buy that product and have it sit on the floor for like, you know, two or three months, right? And that's like, that, that's like already very short. And then it'll go on discount, which means that the data that they have in terms of sell through on that product is really slow. And the time at which they can affect another collection based on what they've learned about the customer is very, very slow. So if you look at a traditional retailer, typically it takes about 18 months for them to actually affect the product they have on the market. That's the reason why a lot of traditional retailers would say, oh, we had a terrible season, right? So by breaking down to monthly collections, by always being affecting your collection on a monthly basis, you can still have terrible collections, but you'll have a terrible monthly collection and that's much better than having like a, a whole season being like a bad collection, right? So the agility in terms of product and data, I think it's super key. Um, I think what's interesting is that, and, and so that's one aspect that's really important. Um, and then the second aspect is aesthetic, right? So we did really, really think about that like a while ago where it was like, well, like Frank and O could also be like Forever 21 and H&M and make like a product for everyone. Uh, and that was the case where it was like, do we just open it up and just make any product for anyone? Or do we actually narrow it down and be very specific about it? And we realized that at the size that we were, and because we're a global brand, being more specific is more recognizable, it's more differentiated. 
So that's why like, we have more of a finely tuned aesthetic now than we had when we first started. Um, because now we have a customer that comes to us for a very specific reason. Over time, of course, we're gonna open it up a little bit more, um, but that's the reason why, that's kind of, those are kind of the business reasons of why you take certain decisions, basically. I don't know if this answer you, I try yeah, to give you an well, overview. Uh, Josh? Yeah, you mentioned personal services a few times, and obviously, what do you feel the impact of the personal service economy would be on the future retail? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we're like, We've started to be really passionate about, and like you know, part of the reason why we are in retail is to actually offer personalized service, right? And so, um, I think that what's interesting about personal service is that people actually really crave uh, human interaction. Like that's kind of what we've learned that actually people like to be helped, and they actually like to speak to someone. So like, it's what like think about when you're buying clothing, right? It's one thing to have like on your screen, like like if you bought this, you can also try these three things. And it's something else if someone's there and says like, oh, well, like I see what you're about. This is like my favorite shirt, you should try it. Like, of course, like that, it doesn't happen like that on the internet. But as an example, one of the things that we've done is that we've shifted a lot of our interaction with customers from emailing to live chat. Because emailing is very one directional, whereas like live chat is an exchange that you can have, a casual exchange where you can actually make product recommendations, you can actually like be like, you can actually take the customer to a product, be like, oh, like, oh, I, I see your profile, you bought this, like, I think you would like that. This, this like, soft kind of human aspect is super powerful, especially when it comes to fashion. Um, so the second question is, if that is true, and I think that it's true for most people, then how do you scale that? How do you replicate that? And I think that's where, you know, technology can help. You know, in a store, the truth is, you can only have one customer at a time. The beauty with live chat is that you can actually manage a lot of different customers at the same time, and there's also like you know automated answers that you can use uh, that also helps with experience. So I can say that it's very important. So, you have three years of work on cash tag, sort of three months. What about your what will it look to be? Sort of three months and three years cash. We're running out of cash, right? And that's why you pivoted. So if you had three months left right now, what would you do? No, no. Oh. He said he pivoted because he had yeah. to have cash. Yeah. Yeah. Then sort of three months, you had three years of work on cash. Like if you had more luxury, basically, of time. <laughs> well, I, I think that like, uh, and, and yeah, I, I would say it's a good thing, like sometimes to have like, you know, uh, and, and, but like to your point, I think it's more, it's important to have milestones that you set for yourself and then evaluate your progress against those milestones. So we didn't decide to make the change because we have three months left. It was more like we were starting to think in that direction with all of our learnings. It was kind of, we had our board where it was like, oh, this worked it'd be cool if we could do that again, you know? Or like this work, it'd be cool if we did that again. The fact that we had only three months left was that kind of trigger that said, well, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do this now. So it, it's more the, the fact that like, it, it, fo it forces you and focuses you to kind of like get things done now, right? So, and that's the reason why I think that, um, although a lot of entrepreneurs hate to have a board of directors, like actually having advisors and board of directors and setting milestones that you actually stick to are super key to the progress of your business because yeah, one of the things that you could also do is just be like, oh, you know, like I'll fix it next month or like, you know, setting that discipline I think is, is an important part of progressing, uh, so. How does that work with investors? What that happen when you ship the together? Do they get carried through or are they think you guys get a decision to, to shut it down? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question because like back then, like we didn't really even think it that way, you know, like I think that we're a much smaller company so it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, focus. Uh, I, would, I would say that it wasn't too hard for us to convince them just because like, we had kind of taken them along. It wasn't like we showed up and be like, oh, we want to change it. It was more like they've also figured out the learnings. You know what I mean? Like, like we've, we've been already sharing the learnings about what works, what doesn't work. So when it came to like, making a change, it was kind of, okay, well, this, this seems like the most natural thing to do. So the shares carried over to the new right now, right through? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think some people, like, it, it, you can go both ways, but in our case, it was like, we still had the support of our investors, and we still had, like, you know, the team was good, so we didn't feel like we needed to start anew. Any last questions? Anybody? Now's your chance. Holdouts? No? Oh, yeah, at the back.
I mean, I, I think that like, um, I, I definitely think that you need to trademark your, your name like, and check that no one else has trademarked it before you start it because having to change names like later on sucks. Like it's just, it's just something you don't want to do because you, you take all this work to kind of put your name out and to like, you know, get traffic and traction on your name. So I would say that if you've looked into it and if you trademarked it, it's not very hard to protect it, you know. Uh, if you don't have it and you're trying to like get someone else's trademark, then that's very difficult. Um, how important is a logo? I think it, it depends what kind of business you run. You know, I think that um, what's interesting is that I think you're referring to like the two dogs logo that we have. It's like, I mean, we don't even use that logo as much as, nearly as much as we used to. Um, so, and, and the reason why it was very strategic actually, uh, when we first started, we we're like, oh, you know, it, it'd be cool to have some kind of like animal logo, you know, uh, that represents kind of what the brand stands for. But as we've grown, we've actually realized that in some ways, like Frank and Oak is kind of like a non-brand brand. Like we actually don't want to be too heavy on the branded side because that's part of what makes it cool. So we actually don't have a lot of like external like labeling on any of our products anymore. And that's the reason why like you will never see like a Frank and Oak like polo with the dogs. You will see it if that customer bought it two and a half years ago. But then you'll know he's had it for a while. But we don't have, it, we don't have any new edition of it. Uh, but the dog logo was cool. Like I like that logo, but it was more like thoughtful as to why we don't use it anymore. Cool. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, I just have uh, a idea. Do you prefer something like a demo or something that's fine or something that you define or do that and go really fast? Or do you do a white one or go to investor with an idea for Yeah, I mean, I think like uh, like ideas are are not worth more much to investors, you know. So I think that, like I always say, you definitely want to have something to show for before you meet with investors. Not necessarily sales or like you know customers, but definitely at least like a working demo. I think it's otherwise it's like what are they buying into, right? Like what are and, and I think what the problem that happens that let's say you go see an investor and you say, I'm working on this, I want to show you to this like in a while, but then like when you come back it's not ready or you need more time, it just looks bad. So you may as well take all the time in the world to make sure your demo is really strong, your products are really strong, and then go see investors. Because like, you, I find that like not a lot of investors want to invest in like R&D, they want to invest in like, when you already have a product that you're ready to take to market, and how they can support you with that. And also because like, you, like money gets spent fast, right? So like, if, if the first 12 months of your money is spent on like developing a product and paying for like your developers, like you're not gonna have a lot of money left after to like actually show traction on it. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, please, guys, uh, give a. Sorry, oh, just one more. Oh, one Sorry. more. Moni. Okay, okay, fine. Let's get you in. Okay. Let's say someone today was to tell you, "I'm gonna take everything away from you in your business. You can only keep one thing. <laughs> what would that one thing be?" Uh, not the dog logo. <laughs> not the dog logo. <laughs> yeah. What would I, like? Like the one thing is that like an actual physical thing, or is that like uh, anything that you want? To say like my employees, my website, my mobile app, my this, my that. Yeah. Um, hmm. And your own camera. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. I think that um, you know what? I'll say something that's a little bit cheesy. Well, obviously, you expect a cheesy answer to this kind of question. Uh, but, but definitely, I think that the, the relationship with my co-founder is like what's kept us together, you know, like from the pivot to like how far we've come now. So I definitely think that like, even if we weren't at this company, like I would hope that we would be together working on another company. So that's the way I look at it. That's awesome. I didn't that's expect that answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great way to end it. So guys, yeah.